Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome to the podcast everybody. Today we have Neil. Neil is an airline pilot, has been for many years, currently flying with a uh, holiday airline. Um, You were living a long haul lifestyle, Neil, on 787 for many years and you've recently decided to swap the Cancun bullets for short haul, um, back by lunchtime flights on the 737. So I didn't know what these were, so first off, what the hell are the bullets? Uh, Nicely put. (laughs) Um, I, well, you know what? I don't think there's actually an official definition for a bullet, but uh, in terms of aviation jargon, um, or a, maybe a made-up word that I seem to have uh, uh, taken into my vocabulary, it means a trip that's less than 24 hours, basically, to your long-haul destination. So a sleep, maybe uh, some breakfast, uh, a bit uh, of a rest, and come back the following day. So it's, it's not a nihilism, it's an actual airline thing. Um, I don't think it's actually written anywhere, so don't quote me on that. But um, (laughs) basically, um, long haul amongst crew is generally talked about as a bullet or a trip. And a trip is generally when you've got a couple of days or a bit more time to rest. And a bullet is, like most long haul programs now, is usually um, there and back because you want to save the company money, basically. Yeah. It's not a holiday. (laughs) Not for the crew, anyway. (laughs) Fair enough. Now, during our sound test, we um, we discovered that the pod track, and I never got this before, but the pod track has some sound effects. So... It'd be right. rude not to just give it one of these, Neil. Mm. Just for the comedy value. <laughs> and we, we also found that it's got some sort of Miami, Miami Vice thing as well, which was this one, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't know how you're going to fit that in. I but... just have no idea. Anyway, we'll stop messing around now, but that, that has no purpose whatsoever. But I just thought I'd get it in there. <laughs> You've kept them out of my reach, though. I can't get them from here. Yeah. So. Yep. Good reason That's for that. Good, good reason for that, yeah. So, apologies for dicking around with the sound effects, but it has to be done. We've only just discovered this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, first off, if you could tell us a little bit how you started out in aviation, Neil, and how you got to, to where you're at now. I suppose the story is not much different from most um, in my position, really. Usually in your teens, uh, a trial flying lesson, which for me would have been probably around 17 at my local airfield. So, it was only down the road, so you'd watch these aircraft come and go, including Concord, actually, at that airfield. Mm-hmm. Um, trial flight, and then the next question, if you've done your trial flight, can you keep it going? Um, where are you going to get the funding to carry on? So first port of call for me was to look for, as most people do now, scholarships, yeah. which I've seen quite a few listed in flight training news now. This is a lot more than uh, when I started flying, which is good. <laughs> yeah, well, I had a look um, yesterday for a customer. There's about 10 or so in there now, yeah, um, uh, including one that we do here, by the way, just plugging it. I'm yeah, yeah nice, <laughs> nice link. Well done. Um, but um, yeah, but funding is, when I talk to students now about learning to fly, that's the biggest consideration. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can't, you know, if you're going to struggle to fund it, my advice is make a plan and start when it's better for you. you it's know. definitely one of my biggest challenges. I mean, I'd pretty much decided at that stage upon leaving school what I wanted to do, like like most pilots, uh, as, as so happens. And um, I think it took me about probably from that decision about 10 years to get all the licenses together because yeah. you're scraping the funds, the money um, and through the self-improver or modular yeah, modular uh, yeah. route as it's called now and what you kind of deliver part of here at Elmat. Yeah. Um, it takes that, that period of time to get it together. Yeah, uh, and then it's look at the draw where the aviation um, cycle is in terms of jobs available, not available, depending yeah. on what's going on. Uh, like, you know, with the economy and 9-11 and, um, well, the pandemic that's just passed, something I, yeah. never, I never thought I would ever see. And so hopefully never a, see again. It's a boom and bust cycle <laughs> yeah. all the time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so it depends where you are when the music stops, um, where you are job-wise. Um, I mean, um, I've been fairly lucky at the moment to be in stable employment, there, even through the pandemic, but there'll be some guys who've been very, very unlucky and probably in a space of about five years, been unemployed three times Yeah. and um, looking for employment again at the moment. Well, we, we just saw literally the last couple of days, um, Flybee's gone into administration again. Yeah, it's, um, um, it's, it's a mis- I never saw that coming. Mis- well, if you look into it probably deeply, you probably could see it coming, but it's yeah. not something I looked out for. Um, no, no. Given there was a lot of media attention in its restart and a lot of preparation during the pandemic for its restart. So that, that comes as a surprise. Yeah. Um, 
albeit not as big a company as it was previously when it went uh, yeah. um, bust. So that's the only good news. And the other good news is there are lots of jobs available. Absolutely. There is in a minute. The airlines are hoovering up on my instructors in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you went the scholarship route. Can you tell us? Uh, well, it wasn't a scholarship that led to anything as such. I mean, one of them I just see listed in, in flight training news is the Royal Navy scholarship for, for gliding. Um, yeah. That was one that came up for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also there's a bit of powered flying involved with that one as well, which is, is not advertised there yeah. uh, with the Fleet Air Arm Association. Um, but that was a start, and um, from there, I was looking at employment to sort of uh, fund my flying. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the issue with that is you've got to be interested in your employment to, <laughs> to make good progress yes. and pay for your flying. So I went on to um, an engineering course at university, which for the, you know, for the life of me, I just couldn't get interested in at all. Uh, but it was during the start of that that I saw another course that cropped up. And there are a few of them about now, these university aviation degrees. And one of the advantages of those at the time was the funding available for it. Yeah. So you could partially fund some of the PPO yourself and you get the rest paid for. That may well have changed. I believe it has changed now. Yeah. So that's another funding stream that seems to have disappeared. Um, but that soon got me my, my license quickly after starting that course. Um, whether the degree has been valuable is another question. <laughs> um, yeah. However, it, it got me that anyway, and most of the knowledge for the ATPLs were, were kind of covered in that. Um, but it, a lot of the guys that did that course, or, or some of them, went on to do integrated courses afterwards. It kind of seemed a bit pointless for those guys yeah. Those guys doing it. But in terms of modular, it gave you a PPL to start off with. It gave mm. you some ATPL knowledge and um, possibly some contacts and industry knowledge to maybe start you off in... Well, lots of other jobs that might be available in operations, um, airports, um, and other services involved with um, airlines themselves. So there's lots of different routes you can go into before you eventually end up with the flying job, which is the goal of most people. That's interesting, because I spoke to somebody recently. I know a few cabin crew who were training to be pilots, and I also know of uh, people who are like TCOs and things that are are going to be pilots. So. There are different careers that you can get into just as a, a bit of leverage to get yourself in the industry, you know, which is, is um, good. What is good to see, I think there's one airline at the moment that offers a, what they call it an apprenticeship, but you've already, most people carrying out the job as the apprentice or yeah. have a, a frozen ATPL. Yeah. Um, that's very useful for the airline because you know those guys are willing to put in the, the hard yards yes. to get their type rating paid for. And I think that's one of the, the better schemes out there at the moment. Yeah. And there are a few others um, that I've just read about uh, today coming to fruition as well. Yeah. Um, but a dispatcher's role is, is quite an important role to ensure um, on-time performance, which yeah, is, absolutely, uh, yeah. especially last summer, has been a major issue with a lot of airlines. So a good dispatcher is yeah. always very, very appreciated in the in the flight deck. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's normally, I think, where most of those roles amongst cabin crew, where some of these uh, guys end up before maybe Ooh. in a year's time, two years' time, getting their time rating. Got an aeroplane in the background, though. Is that one of your sound effects? It's not a sound effect. That's an actual aeroplane. These microphones are good, you know. Wow, that's through about <laughs> three or four different walls. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we are actually at an airport, by the way, so apologies for the airplane noise. So, so you took a modular training route, you started with a scholarship, then you went to university, worked in various aviation jobs, did your ATPLs and modular CPL IR? Yes, I um, eventually... Uh, I'd say splashed out. In the grand scheme of things, the ATPL modular exams are not that expensive, no. um, there were, again, there wasn't many in the way of distance learning schools at the time I did it, and that particular one is still going strong, as it's quite a famous worldwide brand, mm-hmm. that you'd um, fork out maybe, I think it's £800, something along the rounds of £800, £1,000 for the first module mm-hmm. and the second module, which they've now divided up into three modules, I think most schools do. And in between a desk job at an airport, I'd have the yeah. manuals out, usually with the doors closed, and the boss was uh, on another job <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and yeah. um, they were quite, it's quite a good school because you could ring them at any moment if you got stuck on a question, which I quite, yeah. I quite love that approach. Um, that they're always available. And um, yeah, anything you're stuck on, they kind of got you through it somehow. And especially for me, where you're reading these manuals and you're studying for the nth degree and you can get a bit of a blockage and just something like that. It's a quick phone call, something so simple. Yeah, a uh, bit of overload going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's literally what it's like. It's yeah. like um, 
the hose pipe method of learning in yeah. aviation because everything's done at such speed because time yeah. is money. Um, but it, the system works, you know, you get through somehow. You put the effort in, it'll reward you in the end. Yeah. yeah. And then on to, so you did some flight instruction, did a flight instructor rating? Um, well, in between various jobs before that, um, what I've been, I've been security, which is the first job I could grab uh, <laughs> when there weren't many available out of university. Airfield operations, I worked in for a bit, and uh, air traffic control assistant, which was another eye opener to other possibilities out there. Um, where, if, I mean, that's, I think that's where some guys possibly end up or have ended up with a PPL. They've gone on and seen the air traffic control route. There's quite a few interested aviators yeah. um, who are air traffic controllers. Um, and due to making sort of no headway with the funds, I took another job which was slightly better paid outside of avi aviation for a short while. And that's all the uh, get-go I needed to say, right, I don't care what the wages are at the end of it in aviation. Yeah. If, it, if it means working in a remote airfield as a flying instructor, <laughs> um, yeah. I'll do it. You know, um, nine to five, a nine to five desk job was not for me. So I was fully committed at that. And then uh, took the plunge for the CPLIR uh, mm -hmm. with time off work or in between time off work before quitting the job. And then there was a bit of a panic on with the job industry at the time. Yeah. And instructing didn't necessarily jump out initially. Um, and surprise, surprise, here I am many years later still doing it in my, in my own time. Yeah. Um, and it turns out to be one of the better ratings I ever paid for because yeah. at the time there was a mass, as you're saying, a mass exodus of instructors going yeah. to airlines, which is a general, a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. There's often, particularly in the pandemic, I'm sure you had loads of guys knocking on your door. Absolutely. Yeah. It's literally boom or bust for that all the time. And, and yeah. it's actually at the stage now where we've decided to train our own flight instructors. Yeah, so, and I think at the moment where the, the industry is so buoyant, that's the only way you're going to be able to keep people pinned down to absolutely. get something back from them. But I do think from a student yeah. perspective, that is important. You know, oh, no, I appreciate that. So, so I'm always, um, because I'm a, one of your in and out uh, yeah. job guys, if you like, contractor flight instructors, I'm always weary of that, that I never... Uh, yeah, in, but in, it's, you know. with, with you, it's usually you're here for a while. So, and then you go and do a job. So <laughs> it's not... Yeah, yeah. The, the difficulty is, is these kind of short schedules where people are like oh yeah i can do saturday this week but not the next yep. week and do this it, it becomes a problem but but yeah i think for most people um flight instruction is quite rewarding it's not so much about the money but it's quite rewarding oh absolutely so, um you know. i mean at the top end of it there is careers to be had some yeah. guys have, have gone on and done that that i've known to to um i completed my cpl commercial mm -hmm. pilot's license at the same time i've stayed in that industry yeah. and that's something i looked at if i didn't get if i didn't get any breakthrough into what i wanted which was um the end goal was always airline flying, like yeah. most guys start out that way. There's other paths, other um, directions you can take. Yeah. And you can, if you wanted a nine to five flying job, it's probably the nearest you could get Monday to Friday in a commercial school Absolutely, uh, yeah. as an instructor. And it's, yeah, it's very rewarding. Yeah. Um, and it's very consistent work in, you know, especially where they're really short in the commercial side or yeah. multi-engine piston instructor is a really... Um, where they really struggle to recruit guys at the moment because it's so hard to get the uh, the pilot and command hours. On yeah, the absolutely, the 30 hours, yeah. 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 Gone are the days of air taxi where you could easily collect these hours yeah. or drop aircraft off. They seem to have, uh, those sort of hours seem to have disappeared. Of it, yeah. And that's where most of those guys would originally come from before maybe going to airlines after that. But at the moment, there's there's lots of ways to sort of jump that. Yeah. Uh, where most of the... Um, Sort of, should we say, older generation of pilots have often come from often come from that route. Yes. That route kind of has, has disappeared nowadays. I think. Yeah. So on, on from that then, then you did a tight rating for Jetstream thirty one thirty two. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. When I was instructing, yeah, there was a, um, a chap with a hangar at the airfield who was trying to start up. We well, did start up an airline. Um, managed to acquire a, a, three Jetstreams. I think it was and the end Jetstream thirty. I think it's thirty twos, if I remember correctly. Um, mainly doing, which was profitable, what we call PSO mm -hmm. routes, so public, okay. I think it's public service obligations, so you get yeah. government grants to operate right, okay. routes, especially to the uh, remote islands yeah. of the UK, um, and uh, you'd be flying out of places like Isle of Man, um, yeah. often a few Scottish islands, that sort of thing, and um, that, was, that was quite good for a while, although that was a steep learning curve. Uh, I mean, often that was limited to 18 passengers, so you didn't have to take a cabin crew member. Yeah. So you as the 
brand new shiny FO. Making it there. First officer was also the cabin crew, <laughs> was also the loadmaster and general whipping boy, basically. <laughs> uh, for a bit, it's yeah. experience, isn't it? It's, oh, um, yeah, yeah, it was a great experience. There was no autopilot. Um, it was generally limited with supplementary oxygen as well. So one of them didn't go over 13,000 feet because you're, you're pretty much between 10, 13,000. The, the, the cabin's limited to 30 yeah. minutes at that. So. Yeah at altitude but most of the routes fortunately were there they're about 30 minutes anyway because he's popping up and down so lots of approaches um often into a military airfield as well so you get a few pras which you mm-hmm. which you or pars which you wouldn't get in um the civvy world mm-hmm. uh, and sras um and general hands-on flying so the learning yeah, yeah the learning in that was very, sounds sounds quite fun steep. to be fair. So, you know. It was. I mean, again, it wasn't really uh, much in the way of pay, but you wasn't bothered at that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not in my not in my stage in that career anyway. I was just happy to be doing that, um, and naturally that would lead to something else, which it did in the end. So, so that was your first commercial job. Um, so commercial career on from that then, um, night freight then seven five seven. So. T- Tell us about that, the highs and the lows. The the lucky break. So eventually, after handing out many a CV, knocking on doors, etc., up and down the country, eventually an email comes through and you you get a phone call. And, um, yeah, you get asked to come down for an interview, simulator assessment. And fortunately, at the time, when you're flying all these um, manually flown approaches on the the jet stream, the actual speeds in the terminal area around the aerodrome, around mm-hmm. the airfield, are actually the same as what you get in the jet anyway. Oh, okay. The cruise speed is obviously very different. Yeah. But the handling and the basic six layout, which yeah. most of the guys in the private pilot's license would know about, it's actually pretty much the same okay. in the jet stream and even the 757. So when it comes to a sim assessment, it's great because now yeah. there's less levers yeah, <laughs> to yeah, worry yeah. about. And yeah. the dials are the same. And yeah. Um, yeah sometimes and you wait the call and you get lucky and this occasion i was lucky but like many uh should we say a sports trial you can have a you know all the experience of playing for various clubs as a i don't know a footballer for example but it may come down to a trial for a club and you have a good trial and you yeah. you get a job or whatever so so on on from then you moved on to seven five but we're passengers now wasn't it so tell us the big um so highs and lows really are the freight to start off with and then what, what you found the transition to carrying passengers was? Uh, freight, it was quite a long training programme in freight um, because one, there aren't that many training sectors or flying mm. sect- sectors to do. Um, I mean, it's quite a, an expansive network around Europe at the time uh, we were flying on. Um, but, I mean, you could have... As a, as a low hours pilot, you're quite well looked after. I mean, some guys at 40 to 60 sectors, that's quite a lot mm. uh, of sectors. Uh, they're often short sectors. They were thick and fast yeah. as well. Um, albeit, I think there were, there were to major airports, some of them, albeit at the early hours of the morning or, or late at night. Um, so the good things about the, the freight, I suppose, you would land at Heathrow, which is a great one for the logbook. I've never seen it since. <laughs> um Major airports, Warsaw, Tel Aviv, that sort of thing. Um, places you wouldn't normally potentially go to in a passenger aircraft necessarily, unless you, well, in that case, British Airways would uh, certainly put yeah. you in Heathrow every night. But um, uh, for guys working charter airlines and, um, you know, uh, domestic airlines uh, around the UK, you wouldn't, necess- wouldn't necessarily get the chance to land at some of these some of these airports. Mm. Um, so training very good. Um time off it, it's all about your contracts really or yeah or that becomes the further down the line the more time you do with an airline usually the more options that are available to you i know a lot of people after a while go part-time uh, various reasons uh, lifestyle is always a big issue that's a whole, yeah. whole topic in itself um <clears throat> for me i often found after a while i kind of found the night um it was it was bearable for me you, you get on with mm. it. it's a job you get on with it but um compared to what I remember to what I do now, I do remember it after maybe a week of night flying. I needed quite a bit of time to recover. Yeah, yeah. Some guys don't, uh, yeah. but I often found, you know, a couple of days really to start, a, start to feel human again and yeah, yeah. make the most of your time off. Um, so if you're the type of person who can jump out of bed and get going for the day again, it's fine. <laughs> if you go, Definitely not. Yeah. Um, but for me, I, I, I wasn't, that, wasn't really that good at it. Yeah. Um, and that's what I found pretty much when he was when the um, intensity in long haul picked up or the frequency in long haul picked up, it's kind of, kind of similar to that as well. Mm. So, 
So high is the variety, I guess, and lows is just the interference it has with your, your personal life? Or? Well, that, that's the same as all flying, really. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of um, the lifestyle you chose. What you're remunerated yeah. for is uh, the shift system. That's probably no different to guys working in, I don't know, a factory, factory oil yeah. refinery, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You, most of those kind of jobs are compensated for. Albeit with flying, you've got a, a medical to uphold uh, yes. for the rest of your career, and you've also got jeopardy with uh, being examined uh, yeah, intensely yeah. every year or every six months, depending on your airline. Yeah. So uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe in refinery jobs, that sort of thing, factory jobs, you've, you've got similar assess- assessments of some degree, but yeah, that's always a risk with the um, yeah, it the, could the job, end because so. of something outside. Yeah. Um, so passengers then, what was the, um, so you same aircraft, but obviously I imagine there's a vast difference between carrying, you know, passengers in the back to, to boxes and crates and things. I suppose that was the big shock for me was how quickly you're put through the training system when I switched airlines, because you're qualified on type, mm-hmm. off you go. Yeah, uh, effect yeah. to a certain degree, obviously you do a, you carry on a, an operator conversion course, uh, minimal line training because time is money of course yeah. you're qualified so I've got you going to it <laughs> yeah. um, which compared to some of the guys who joined same time as me from say another charter airline they're used to passengers in the back but that mm. was actually quite a reasonably big thing, thing for me you know yeah. you've got people at all doors yeah. they have to be included in the brief at the start of yeah. the, the flying day they want to know how disruptive it's going to be to because they've got a bit of pride in their job in the back as well how turbulence is going to disrupt the day Mm-hmm. How long the taxi time is going to be? They've been caught out with that in the past, where you can end up the holding point in minutes, and the cabin behind you is not ready. Um, so yeah, there's a few things to consider, and when you get a call from doors four, you're thinking, "By heck, uh, oh, that's right at the back, isn't it?" Yeah, yeah. Um, because in freight, that's you're locked in. That's you. Boy, yeah. That's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Neil yeah. is northern. There's northernness um, is coming out. It, sli- it, it slips out now and again. Do- um, doors four, lad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so the freight obviously is, is not disruptive, it doesn't get ill, um, yeah. and it doesn't talk back to you as well. So um, once the freight's in, that's yeah. it, sealed, it's in. Um, there's no slides to arm, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas communication, even from a simple thing as arming doors, disarming yeah. doors, that's all communicated, all from back to front, all the way to the flight deck and back right. again. So you've got to bring the rest of the, the team on board, if you like. Yeah, so you've got a team to manage, so I guess it's more... Uh, crew and resource management then than it is just being a pilot you know so yeah I mean especially for the the commander on long trips etc he's got to um, oversee you know potential HR issues um, illness down route that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah there's there's um, more to just handling the jet for a lot of the uh, I suppose you 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 know it's you never get an issue well I can't imagine an issue where you might have to divert for something in the back of the aircraft on freight maybe um whereas i would imagine it's an occurrence that happens every now and again where you get a sick passenger and you have to divert yeah i, I think i've been quite lucky i can only think of a couple um in my time flying uh, charters but you, you could be unlucky and it comes in waves it's not in yeah, threes yeah. isn't it like buses yeah. Or I suppose un- unruly guests or that kind of thing <laughs> <Stand Yeah. dudes. laughs> yeah it happens um, there's particular flights or routes that seem to attract yeah, the same absolutely. crowd so you can yeah. kind of anticipate that yeah again that's the cabin crew will um, yeah. especially experienced cabin crew will certainly know about certain routes or, or destinations yeah, yeah. that might attract um, a certain clientele of passengers so they manage their day accordingly maybe restrict alcohol or services at certain times that sort of thing that's that's up to them that's that's their job yeah um, and you just keep them advised of the conditions for the day yeah um particularly maybe when you're flying over in terms of long haul which i, I think you're going to talk about in a moment is um if you're ever remote destinations so you you've yeah. got um and there's a period of time where should a decompression occur yeah there might be a significant period of time before you can descend to an acceptable level right to call okay somebody to the flight deck to advise on the next set of intentions it yeah can be you know yeah um and some routes you know probably well over 45 minutes in some routes before you can yeah get to a, a decent or a level below ten thousand feet yeah yeah um so long haul then so um he's looking at his cup he's wishing he had a cup of tea now right? yeah. i'm sure <laughs> we need a little bell don't we there's a <laughs> ding ding cup of tea please um <laughs> So, well-known airline flying 787 long haul. 
So what did you most like, you know, this was your previous job now, wasn't it? So same company, but previous, um, previous role. So what did you enjoy about long haul? Well, initially it was new destinations, I suppose, and obviously a brand new machine. So it wasn't get, long. We need to get you a new chair. It wasn't, you, sorry, am I, uh, he's, he's creaking. Stop creaking. Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so new destinations. Um, yeah, it's also a new machine. So it's not long out the Boeing factory. A lot of the aircraft arriving at the airline were literally just out the cellophane. You could have that new car smell yeah. in there as well, which yeah. I, I've not experienced before after flying old, you know, wrinkly, yeah. not wrinkly aircraft, but um, old battered aircraft, really. It was quite interesting to see a, an aeroplane just outside the factory. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, you know, that brand new smell of upholstery. It doesn't last long, but it was good no, no. <laughs> to get the second or the third flight or something do, like that. Yeah. Do you have many issues when you wear craft, like teething problems? Or? Uh, has been known. I, not myself, but generally, I think when the, uh, when some of these aircraft, as you know, were the Max, of course, mm. um, with other airlines um, and around the world, there has been teething issues, a bit like, um, a new car, I suppose. Some people yeah. like to go for the old trusted and tested model, and that particularly applies to aviation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas the brand new, um, you're kind of, I wouldn't say the guinea pig would be quite a harsh uh, harsh term, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, it's it's not tried and tested to the extreme, so... But there was that, um, I can't remember what year it was, 1980, I want to say 1983, somewhere around there. They made a film about the, was it the 76, when that first came out? And there was um, an issue where they were changing the fuel conversions to metric. And they, um, I can't remember what the film's called. I think it's like Flight 74 something. And it's a true story. It happened Canada World Airways, it was. That sounds familiar. Uh, yeah. yeah, and they um, they had an issue where the fuel conversion, had, they, they couldn't fathom out the fuel conversion. The fuel computer was broken. So yeah. they had to input what they thought they'd put into it. And the pilots were a bit like, well, f do we trust this? And they were like, well, you've got to trust the computers and it's got a backup computer. <laughs> and they had, because it was, you know, they had the uh, engineer on board that flight and they kept having fuel alarms going off. And yeah. um, they got the engineer up to the cockpit and said, look, you know, what do you reckon to this? So they were, they're all going through the um, QRH and things. And um, he says, oh, well, we need to bypass the fuel to start off with and it worked for a minute and they thought it might be a fuel pump issue or whatever and then it started beeping again they realized that actually they're on vapors this thing hasn't got enough fuel to get where they want it and they haven't even got enough fuel to divert where they where they could so they ended up landing in um a disused uh, air force thing which happened to have car racing on on the day and they landed safely everyone walked away from it but it was a you know <laughs> the glide can be done it, it, in the 767 it, it, it literally that was it it literally the fi you know the film's probably exaggerated to some degree but it happened you know I, mean, that's, I think it's on National Geographic the, is it the Gimli glider yeah yeah, yeah, yeah the Gimli it. glider yeah. yeah yeah that's it that's where they landed and, and the guy had to <laughs> had to side slip this thing in to get the height off because they, they just weren't going to make it otherwise P PPL skills coming yeah, into play yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he was some sort of uh, he'd had a lot of um, sailplane anyway so that yeah. was natural to him but not in the aircraft that size but but yeah so that was technology but um so yeah new aircraft new procedures um what else we got there you you know you, you told me some e tops i haven't got a clue what e tops are oh yeah i mentioned that to you the other day and you looked at me very blankly but yeah that's the thing with aviation there's so many acronyms yeah. in there that you kind of after a while you, you you're kind of ignorant that you know a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know what they mean and yeah so ETOPS, Extended Twin Operations. Okay. So in the days when four engines were better than two or three yeah. going across the Atlantic, they decided when aircraft or aircraft engine reliability improved significantly over the decades, they realised, well, we can save a lot of fuel just by flying twin engines across. Yeah. However, we're putting a few more precautions and a, a bit more pre-flight planning and providing um, the airlines, the operator meets these requirements, will extend them access to extended twin operations, reward them, certify okay. them for that. And that is, I think for a while, the 767 was making the most flights across the Atlantic. For, I think it might have yeah. changed, that might have changed um, in, in recent years. But that used to be the, um, the most common aircraft that made that trip back and forth. Yeah. I guess engines are becoming more efficient and things now. And 
that's the way it's going, isn't it? It's, they're uh, very reliable. Well, it's, as long as they've got fuel, they're very reliable and looking yeah. spinning, so they say. But um, obviously, uh, prepare for the worst. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, so new aircraft, new tech, new destinations, new procedures. So why, why did you decide in the end to, um, to kind of uh, move on to short haul? What did you dislike most about the, the long haul stuff? What I liked most, or still like most, is variety. So on the 757 and 767, which is, is classed as the same type rating, same fleet, yeah. you get quite a bit of variation. You'd often be on an intense short haul over the summer with all the uh, European destinations people would normally fly to on holiday. And the 767, you'd get use of mainly in the, mainly in the winter mm-hmm. on, on long haul. So you get the best of, of both worlds. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, doesn't really, there isn't really a fleet out there at the moment that kind of yeah. allows for jumping back and forth. Um, maybe in the future, but at the moment, there's none there. So on, when you opt for long haul, mm-hmm. which is what, they, or what a company would like to use their long haul aircraft, or their, mm-hmm. their big aircraft for, is what it's designed for with less landing cycles. They want it to go back and forth for as long as possible yeah. to the long haul destinations, whether that's um, eastbound to the Far East, uh, Far East Asia, or whether it's um, as were most holiday destinations are usually on uh, you know the east coast of uh, America, the United, the United mm. States, or the Caribbean, um, and that's often quite limited where the uh, UK public want to travel to. So after a yeah. while, you're going back and forth to the same destinations. Yeah. And uh, depending again, if you're if you're doing this full time, you're going back and forth pretty much to the same area. So let's talk about um, your transition then to um, to short haul. Short haul. Well, this is a bit probably uh, a strange transition for me because it was over the pandemic. So I had numerous courses um, stalled, cancelled, delayed until eventually uh, a training course comes up. And then once you get going, <laughs> the um, COVID appears again and slows things down, um, which after a big gap was probably not a, not a bad thing for me, that you could absorb most of the training material at a slower pace, I suppose. Hmm. But um, after working that sort of network before, you kind of, you're familiar with the network, albeit it's a newer, smaller machine, possibly a little bit, little bit more twitchy than what you've been used to. Yeah. There's less inertia there, so if you point it one way, it might not, not necessarily stay pointing that way like the bigger machine. Yeah. Um, with all that mass, it will just stay in the direction you put it in. Um, and also there's a lot more manual flying, which is was gradually disappearing. I know most airlines are encouraging pilots to take that up again, should the conditions permit. So mm. usually a good... Uh, VMC day or clear sky day yeah. um, to a, a non-busy airport, it's generally encouraged to try and uh, uh, think through flying it manually or actually fly it manually. Yeah. So, which definitely gets rusty after a while. It's, um, so when you, when you say flying it manually, um, how much of that flying would you do manually? Well, in the cruise, I mean, there's, there's two things at play. One's Fuel efficiency, that's that's the yeah. big headline for most uh, commercial companies at the moment, especially with the price of fuel. And secondly, the uh, passenger comfort. Yeah. So you don't want somebody to uh, to, to be at the front for their own benefit, <laughs> to, fly, Chicken them around. to fly circles and, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, big angles of bank and trying to get it, you know, there's, it's, yeah. um, they're the two, two uh, headlines that must kind of be delivered. Generally, um, it's probably about three or four levels of automation depending on on uh, the aircraft machine, whether it's Boeing or Airbus. Uh, in a general rule, I can probably categorise maybe four. Okay. Um, so most of the data or most of the information, performance information you'll put in, route information will be into a computer. computer mm-hmm. And you would click the autopilot to take care of that after takeoff. Mm-hmm. until pretty much lined up for landing at the other side. Mm-hmm. So the computer will um, set the best performance speeds um, along the way and uh, levels to fly at mm-hmm. um, for fuel efficiency. And off you go and you monitor that. Okay. Or both pilots monitor that en route. The other step down in automation might be to use the flight director autopilot system and what we call the mode control panel. Yeah. So changes that are required more instantaneous, such as on the approach to an airport, or usually below 10,000 feet in what we call mm. the terminal sort of area around the approaches to airports, 
you need to respond to instructions that little bit quicker. So you would use the modes on this panel. Yeah. Still using the automatics or the yeah. automation. Uh, and it would turn, climb, etc., etc. And then the drop below that is if you disconnect both your autopilot mm -hmm. and your auto throttle, yeah. um, you can manually follow the flight director with your own manual right. inputs on those. And then your fellow pilot, pilot monitoring would make the changes or responses from for air, air traffic control in the mode control panel. Okay. And uh, in you go. And then the uh, fourth um, category, not an official category, is what would probably be termed raw data. Um, another bit of jargon, I suppose, <laughs> which means moving away the flight directors. Yeah. And that's probably where the most sort of practice, most skill is required, I would say, yeah. or the, where most of the, uh, the skill is lost in, um, in airline flying. Um, and that's knowing your sort of pitch power settings like you do in your yeah. pilot's license. Yeah. Um, but on a on a bigger yeah. bigger scale. Most of the pitch settings are not far off what your crews would be necessarily. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the way the manufacturers make the aircraft is, is generally the same, um, if, you know, for the crews and a, de and a, and a descent and a climb, et cetera. Okay. Um, pretty much through most aircraft models. Yeah. So... Back to the, the short haul stuff then. So you like the variety of the destinations and routes. You you like the 7.3 because it's, it's less automation there, more hands-on flying. And you mentioned that in some of the places there's still visual approaches available. Yeah, the, I think they're gradually disappearing as particularly some of the remote, remote islands where most people like to holiday. So the navigation aids such as a simple NDB, mm. non-directional beacon, beacon seems to be disappearing and uh, where places don't have an ILS now, thanks to GPS, there's yeah. a lot of these, um, you'll hear terms like RNAV, r yeah. approaches, but they're, yeah. they're basically based on a GPS, yeah, yeah. Uh, mainly the American system, the Navstar system, mm -hmm. um, that um, these will be certified at most remote airfields now, so say they, they can't afford an ILS or they can't afford to yeah. calibrate it or, or keep it checked, mm -hmm. then uh, most of these places will now have a GPS approach, which takes yeah. away the fun of kind of the, uh, the rough I think even Sywell's got a GPS approach now, but only 2XL are allowed to use it, I think. So it's... Um, yeah, there's a few hoops uh, to jump through, really. Yeah. Um, the operator has to be certified, and the, obviously yeah. the airfield has to be certified, and also the pilots, the crew has to be certified Yeah, as, as well. It's, I think the main thing that you, we talked about previously was the, the less impact on, you, on your personal life, really, on the short it's, um It's horses for courses. Um, I mean, I, I like to be busy. Uh, generally, so I like to know I'm going to get an approach and a landing when I go to work. That's not necessarily the case in long haul. You could have a crew yeah. of three or four uh, rotating. You could be cruise pilot only, so you might not okay. even see the takeoff. You might not see the oh, landing. Wow. And um, if you have a bit of pride in your work and you have a, yeah. a not so good landing, <coughs> you might have to wait quite a bit of time to correct that. And yeah. <laughs> put it right, which is quite annoying if you take a bit of pride yeah, uh, yeah. in the work you do. Whereas at least you can correct it next day or on the next uh, sector if you are in, yeah. in short haul. Um, I mean, in busy short haul, uh, particularly over a summer season, uh, with an ad hoc roster that you wait for every month, can be uh, hit or miss if you're trying to plan days off mm -hmm. and people are trying to pin you down for a certain birthday, wedding, that sort of thing. It can be difficult. Flight to, instruction, uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, getting calls <laughs> for flight instruction, yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, it can be difficult to, to offer days to people ahead, which, you know, doesn't bother me too much, but certainly annoys the people around you. Um, trying to get stuff organised or pin you down. Yeah. But there are ways around that now. I mean, there are many contracts out there. Again, after a while, a lot of people generally go part-time and you're guaranteed certain days off per month. Yeah. And that, that's the way around it. But I've, I've not quite done that yet. Um, and yet, if you've got plans to go away on holiday the following year, yeah. you then have to pin the other other people involved in your holiday down, yeah. uh, partners, family, um, to plan their time off around yours because you have yeah. to put your bid in or your application in literally potentially up to 12 I think even further ahead to get the following year off Absolutely, uh, in a yeah. period. and that's for some people seems alien but yeah. after doing it for many a year um, I think that's a big thing is that the people don't realize that the, the airline in some respects have quite a lot of control over your lifestyle and time you know, yeah, that is often the bugbear, I think, for a lot of um, commercial pilot guys. But, um, you know, that's for me, that's that's kind of what you're remunerated what, for. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what you're paid for. You're paid for disruption to your life. Yeah. So when pilots, I suppose, whinge about uh, paying conditions, that is that is generally the top of the list. Not going I on think. strike, though, like yeah. train drivers at the minute, anyway. 
<laughs> no, no, it has it has been known, but um, yeah. no, I've it's uh, I'm fortunate to work for a, maybe work for a company where it doesn't really get yeah. anywhere near that. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. So then, let's have a look at some advice then for anyone going into aviation now. First of all, know you want to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised at the amount of people that will turn up at a flying school who like the idea of it. Yeah. But wanting to do it is another thing. If you're a talented person, unlike me, then at least have a career backup yeah. or a plan um, to maybe enter another career should things not yeah. work out. So have know where your exits are, basically. I think um, I think that's important in any career, though, isn't it? It's just don't put your eggs in one basket because you know you're going to spend a, a ton of money doing this. So you need to know you've got the right career lined up in the first place. And I think for some people, it might even be getting the reality of it by talking to people like you. You know, it's true. Talk, talk to some airline pilots and see what it's about because it's not all glamour, is it? You know, some no. of it is. Uh, uh, also, it there's lots of other careers out there. Uh, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, it's not all about airline flying yeah, or flying jets at the end of the day. There's yeah, lots yeah. of rewarding careers out in aviation, which I've had a quick glimpse of on the long, uh, along yeah. the way. Yeah. But a lot of people have stayed with it and they get... Well, um, a good feeling out of doing that job. So Derek, who we spoke to, he was the previous airline pilot we spoke to, um, he actually did some bush flying and he was doing all kinds of aid flying and all that kind of stuff, you know, dropping off uh, medicines and all that kind of stuff. That'd have been so, great, yeah. Yeah, um, and he, he said that was the most rewarding part of his flying career. I bet. Yeah. Um, so I think the other thing is have a plan, isn't it? You know, make sure you explore all of the routes. So we've got the modular route, the integrated route, you've got MPL now so a lot all of that stuff sounds very confusing to people going into it so i think it's really important that you understand the implications of the route you're taking because some of them have huge financial implications if it goes wrong exactly and yeah. there has been recent cases of that particularly mm -hmm. on integrated courses with the pandemic recently from what i've heard there were people um, being offered drone flying um, after completing really? an integrated course. Oh my God. And that would be a shocker to me, especially if, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's not in my business how people's funding comes about, but let's yeah. say you've been fortunate enough for maybe your parents to remortgage their house to attend one of these integrated yeah. courses. At the end of it, you're flying a drone, remote control, basically. I think <laughs> I don't think yeah. you're going to be pleased with that outcome, and no, I don't think no. your sponsor is going to be pleased with the outcome yeah. with that as well. So you just got to bear that in mind. Things look rosy at the moment. Yeah. All of a sudden, a year later, it don't look so rosy in aviation. I think it's just a case of explore what suits you best. You know, your circumstances. The majority of people tend to lean towards modular, I think, these days, because it's a bit safer. You get a qualification at the end of each stage. It's yep. financially less risk because you're paying for each module one, one at a time you can go back to it if you need to later on um, but i guess if you're exploring the integrated and mpl options just make sure you understand the full implications before you get into it yeah and what i'd say to you simon if i had it with me is my license here yeah guess what you get at the end of your modular course yeah qualification. guess what you get at the yeah. end of the integrated course yeah yeah you know um with training and especially aviation training it's what you put into it so yeah. if you do the acquired re the required reading when yeah. asked to do it, turn yeah. up on time, um, do the training, um, and follow the what's been you being advised to do. You'll mm -hmm. get your rewards at the end of it. So you get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. And also, as unlike potentially other work or, or training courses, you're your own sponsor, so you're paying for it. So if something's not working for you, yeah, you need to train uh, to change it, not just sit there and accept it and then yeah. Be, quite angry about it later you need to get onto it straight away whether that's i don't know what it is a personality clash of the instructor yes. or aircraft availability or something that's not working for you at that school yeah. do something early not yeah. late yeah i mean i think that's the thing some students you know we don't have too many student problems but inevitably every school does but a lot of it is how you deal with it sit down with them have a conversation can you fix it you know if we can because it might be that yeah they have been messed around with instructors and you haven't realized you know it's, it's easily done um but it is like you say it's all about personalities so if it's not yeah. working some it's not working you know i've had like in, on an odd occasion there's been one student where i thought you know what i've done the best for that person i can't do anymore yeah. so if you want to go to another school i wish you all the best yeah. yeah, the red flag that comes up now and again is this this person's had six instructors in a month and you're thinking, mm, yeah. okay, so that yeah. kind of uh, raises an eyebrow a little bit. For, but yeah. some somebody will work for you 
somewhere. So you'll find somebody that, that will work. Yeah, absolutely. Think, so. Absolutely. And and likewise, you know, we see people coming from other schools who have left for those kind of reasons. Um, and I just think you've got to do what's best for you. You've got to get the training that works best for you with the people you feel most comfortable with. You know. And also the logbooks as well when they come in and you see exercise 10 slash, uh, slash 13 after yeah. about two hours. <laughs> you think there's something up there. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've got a question. Well, we we had a guy recently, and I've, I've said this to you, I think, the other week, but he came in from another school and he wanted to get my opinion on whether he should move. And I'm like, well, you know, only you know that, but tell me your circumstance. And he had, I thought I misheard him to start off with. He said, I've got seven zero seventy hours and I've not been solo yet. And I sort of said, look, I'm really sorry to say this, but it either says something about your ability as a student or more so your flying school and a bit of both, you know. And I looked through his logbook and he'd flown like every aircraft they had. And I'm not talking about, you know, five different 152s. I'm talking about 172s, 152s, four different variants of PA-28. And I just said, I'm not surprised to some degree. I am surprised the hours are that high and they haven't pulled you up on it and said, we don't want to continue this way anymore because that that should be their, you know, duty of care to say, look, this isn't working out, you know, so... Um, they should have definitely stopped him. I think they were potentially just rinsing him, to be honest. <laughs> it has been known to go on. Yeah, yeah. and um, and I said, and secondly, you know, you've you've kind of allowed this to happen yourself. You have to take some responsibility for this because, um, you know, you shouldn't be flying all these different aircraft. They should be telling you that because you're not going to have the continuity you need, and you and you should have probably pulled this up a long time ago and said, actually, I'm not making any progress. Let's not accept this. Let's move somewhere else. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is. There's a lot of things to know about flight training, unfortunately. Some good, some bad. Um, but I think you've just got to choose a route that that suits you. So, any other advice before we head off? It's all we covered. Know you want to do it. Have a plan. And if regards funding, particularly on modular, make sure you've got enough funds to complete that particular segment module. Yeah. There's nothing worse than almost getting to the finish line and running out of funds. So that's yeah. the good thing about modular as well, I suppose, is you can stop. Which is what yeah. I did. I go get your funding for your next part. And then, I think uh, that there's an important message there as well because I've um, spoken to people um, about that when they've got that situation where they're nearly at the end of their training and they're sort of thinking, "Look, I might give up, right?" And and I think it's the worst thing to do. I really do um, because, and I did this. That's a, that's why I know it's it's a bad thing. Is that if you stop and you're three quarters of the way through. When you return to it a year, two years later, whenever that is, you're not going to be the same ability as when you left. Nowhere near. There's, there's always regret with that. The, the yeah. best one that I see every so often, you get an airline pilot come in who's let their SEP, single engine piston, yeah, lapse. lapse yeah. uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 years. And yeah. they've got time on their hands now. They're, they're near retirement or whatever. And they fancy taking it up again. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's always the landing with airline pilots yeah. because they used to hear that 50, 40. <laughs> it doesn't Flaring exist. at 50 feet and ballooning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's been a few occasions uh, I can think of a, a jumbo yeah. jet pilot, should we say, who he spent a lot of money trying, yeah, <laughs> purely yeah. in the circuit trying to get his landings back in again, but he did enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, it's all good fun. But I think the key thing is communicate. If you have problems, talk to your school. And they might even be able to help you. You know, They might be able to help you in some way. But um, anyway, Neil, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and um, really enjoyable episode. And please do remember to subscribe to the channel, smash the like button as well. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.